I do for a living every day is uh, take energy and apply it to a human body. And ever so, in fertility, I change the mass of the person I come in contact with. If I apply energy and that energy is turned into matter, then the treatment of the human spine or the treatment of the body by physical means of any type of force changes the amount of light that is in a person. And I look at uh, DNA as a, a construct that takes protein, gives a shape, uses minerals to highly define the shape of the proteins that are there, and vitamins that facilitate the formation of the proteins with very many trace minerals present to give every individual DNA output a very precise frequency. So what I do all day long is I work on the spine. And I found out on the way here yesterday that I must shut off the right brain. Because when I go into a room, if my mind is not 100% looking at the patient with no thoughts, what I anticipate as a way of diagnosing the patient doesn't happen. I listen to the story. We do the standard look at the MRIs, CAT scans, or whatever the blood test is, do the orthopedic neurological workup because that's all expected in the profession I'm in. But what happens next is I put my hand at one end of the spine and I put my hand at the other end of the spine and my mind is completely cleared. And I say to myself, what am I supposed to fix? And within five to 10 seconds, I start seeing little tiny flashing lights, which I believe are biophotons, emitting between three and six inches away from the spine. And some of them are brighter, some of them are bigger, some of them are off. And when I know the color and location, I know exactly what I'm dealing with. Now, if that doesn't occur, I may have an overwhelming emotion that comes after me. And if I don't have that, I may experience the pain that the patient is perceiving. And I can tell if the patient's lying, because if they say they have a headache and I put my hands on them and my foot hurts, I ask them, well, does your foot hurt too? And they go, yeah, well, that's where I start. Because the blockage of energy resulted in some form of a headache. So when you do end up with a chiropractor with a good set of hands and he's moving your vertebrae, he is changing at the speed of light the perception of every cell in your body and the ability of that cell's DNA to then change the protein synthesis. Now I get really nervous talking to a bunch of people and this is a cottage that's about 30 miles south of the James Bay and the only way you can get there is by airplane. And I had all the material helicoptered in 12 years ago and this is where I go to write books. And I also fish. Uh, it takes four burners and a frying pan for us to fulfill our, our requirements. And this is one of my neighbors. This is a moose. And we have caribou. Now, I do grow a garden up there, but I never get to see it because these animals take the pleasure before I do. This happens to be the bird that I own, and this is how we get so far into Canada. Um, I got some contact stuff, which you can find in a brochure. There's many things I could talk about, but I'll be talking about minerals for the genetic code for the most part, and then showing you how applications in everyday environment are starting to play havoc with this code. I have a 16-year-old son, and when I lecture, most of the lectures I lecture to are organic farmers, because I try to teach them what minerals need to be in the soil so that their plants have the best chance of growing without needing glyphosates or, or any of the other herbicides or insecticides and encourage them to avoid genetically modified food at all cost because I can't eat what they grow. I eat only organic food. Now, I, I learned this morning that glo uh, global warming is not really happening, but I'd have a hard time telling that to my son because in northern Michigan, the lakes freeze at the beginning of November, at the latest, November 15th, and my son is water skiing on January 8th, four years ago. So. We were believing global warming is happening that year. Now, my son was ADDH until we had one lesson. Well, <laughs> the speedometer says we're going 99 miles an hour, and he has a little bit of fear on his face because we can't spank him. You know, we don't want to get turned in. <laughs> Approximately one third of the children take vitamins, 50% of Americans take vitamin and minerals, and 92% of vitamins and minerals are imported from China. Believe me, there's something very wrong with that picture. Not the first two statistics, but the third statistic. If you ever sat down and analyzed a bottle of vitamins and minerals coming from any of the big box stores, you'll find that the most abundant mineral is aluminum. And you'll find polyethylene glycol and you'll find talcum powder. You'll find things that you, 
that a, a non-chewable vitamin has aspartame and sucralose. It's just unbelievable the chemicals that we put into what we call vitamins. This is the book that uh, Chuck Walters um, and I wrote. Uh, for those of you that don't know Chuck Walters, he was the founding editor of Acres USA uh, back in 1971. And when I had met Chuck, it's because I was hitchhiking down the road on one Sunday when everything in my life went wrong. I got picked up by two organic farmers. Uh, within two days, I was in contact with Chuck Walters. Two weeks later, I was then in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, collaborating on a book with Chuck. And the book is in three parts. The first part of the book, Chuck wrote, and it basically says, we can't genetically modify our food chain. This is just ludicrous and stupid. The second part of the book I wrote, which talks about the minerals, the standard genetic chart, it cross-references into the flow of magnetic energy. I've laid out all the acupuncture meridians, exactly what time of day the minerals regenerate by the hour and what acupuncture meridians they're affiliated with. Uh, we have the I Ching affiliation with that, uh, colors, and, and quite a few stuff. Second book, which is at the printers right now, is An, an Amishman's Handy Guide to Vitamins and Minerals. And I found that I do house calls uh, to two different communities every month, and this is my eighth year of doing so. Their education process ends when they're 14 in the eighth grade, and they really don't include nutrition, and they're pretty much a bunch of suckers for, for multi-level products. Uh, so I wrote a 600-page reference book, give it to a kindergarten teacher, had it rewrote, give it to a doctor of chiropractic in Ohio who only has Amish patients. So we have this Amish ready, and it should be out by the 15th of August. I'm going to take the cover off, and I'm going to be putting it on the open market as a Christian homeschooler's guide to vitamin, minerals, and supplementation. I have 300 herbs in the books, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and we have 141 herbs of the Bible with quotations from the book that you'll never see unless you want a copy, I'd be more than happy to give it to you, is called Minerals for Tumor Suppressing Genes. Uh, this book explains the interreaction between minerals, subatomic particles, and the uh, standard genetic code. And our books do include noble gases, which allow your thought process to interact directly with amino acids in the creation of your three-dimensional uh, proteins. And uh, a book that I wrote about six years ago, but I got divorced, and every time I write a book, I get sued by my ex-wife. It's called Minerals for Acupuncture Meridians. Uh, it's more of an in-depth study of what's in the first book. And there's a couple of books that I really like. Magnesium, uh, it, you can't live without magnesium, and almost everybody is deficient. Now, that book says magnesium in the cell, and it should say magnesium in the kidney. kidney. Uh, quarks, uh, the stuff of matter. In 1977, I was turned on to a book called Atomic Suicide by Dr. Dr. Walter Russell. And in the book, he had a periodic chart that has 27 minerals lighter than hydrogen, heavier than photons. And in 1977, I understood the flow of magnetic energy. And it was 1984 that this was the first book that came out. And it was basically a, a parallel, direct parallel. So it took me three years to take the names of the common subatomic particles and apply it to the Walter Russell charts. And this includes quarks, anti-quarks, uh, neutral currents. Uh, we've got the Higgs bows in there. Uh, everything heavier than a photon, lighter than hydrogen, I look at as minerals that our DNA code hyperaccumulates. And we analyze these through various ways of looking at the body through weak magnetic energy. The role of selenium in nutrition. Uh, my question was uh, earlier directed as to detoxification pathways of selenium. I, I run into a, an elderly gentleman who wrote a book. His name is Dr. Hal Huggins. He wrote a book that's all in your head, and the whole book was about mercury fillings. And in his book, I said to him, I says, I, I understand that semen is a proposed mechanism of selenium detoxification. I says, well, why is it there? He just goes, I don't know. I says, well, let me tell you, you know, the oxidation state of, of mercury is plus two and selenium is negative two in the human body and it just bonds and it just, it's a way of carrying it out of the body. And um, I said, well, selenium, 50% of it's found in the male testicle. So on the way home, after telling him that, I started to think, the Epstein bar, not the Epstein bar, but the, uh, the, um, the Gardasil that was mentioned this morning, if men have fillings in their mouth and they're putting all their mercury into the reproductive organs of their partner and then that body is taking and losing all of its selenium to that organ, that opens that organ up to viruses. The human papillary virus, it was like, hmm, maybe fillings are having a more profound effect than we even thought. 
This is the book that I read in 1977, and I put it on the shelf for a number of years, and then two years ago with Fukushima, uh, Demi, I had to pull it back off because this book predicted everything that was going to happen with the use of nuclear energy and that what's happening and what the general population is being told are two different things. I did go to ground zero. I do like adrenaline rushes. I was on the ambulance crew. I run an acute clinic. I don't take appointments. You want to wait and see me, that's fine. I opened up all the hospitals in the country to get CAT scans and MRIs, and I can take anything and everything on. And this was my favorite picture out of the hundreds of pictures I took. There was a chiropractic office right across the street from ground zero. Okay, the central dogma of biology is DNA to RNA to make a protein. DNA is unfolding. I take the grand unified theory of everything, which is strong and weak, electric, gravity, and magnetism, and I make an attempt to apply these concepts using minerals and subatomic particles, overlaying it on the standard genetic chart. Strong electrical forces. At every cell membrane, you have calcium going in and magnesium. Magnesium is on the inside, calcium is on the outside, and they're constantly going back and forth. Sodium and potassium go back and forth. I believe they're going to uncover an aluminum boron pump because these minerals are constantly coming and going. They can measure these as strong electrical forces. And whenever you generate a strong electrical force, you generate magnetic fields. Whether it's a 110 wire coming through these fields, through these wires, which generates electric fields, or whether it's at a cell membrane. And then to carry this energy through the whole body, we have cells without a nucleus called red blood cells, and they have iron in it, which allows this magnetic field to generate through the whole system. Weak electrical activity is because we generated it from the strong. There's 12 weak magnetic fields in the acupuncture meridians. I won't dwell on them very long. I'll go through them quick. The bladder meridian is the most extensive. It goes from the corner of your eye to your little toe. If you have sleepies in your eyes, you need to address the bladder meridian by taking iodine. If your gallbladder is not working right, you may have headaches, pains in your sides, and the stomach. Now, these three are grouped because they are affiliated with the halogen fields. The heart, the lung, and the pericardial sac, they are grouped together, and they deal with primarily the mineral boron, the liver, spleen, and the kidney deal with sodium, potassium, and lithium, and then the large intestine, small intestine, and one called three burners, which was really your Krebs cycle, all deal with uh, basically nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, there are other examples of weak magnetic energy or reflexes in the body. The human spine, hand reflexology, foot reflexology, the chakras, iridology, auricular therapy, and then the actual fingers themselves is where your electrical valences can be perceived. Now, I made up a chart that no one's seen before, and I'm actually releasing it here for the first time. As a light goes through the prison, I look at the brain as the primary photon creator. And this would be how light would come through the skull as the direction of light, as a generator of biophotons in the real fields and in the subatomic fields. And each one of them squares represents a different mineral. And that's the master chart that's got the acupuncture meridian, the time of day, the amino acid, and the Yixing understanding. Now, when I look at gravity, I look at the number of electrons in a given mineral. So there's no mineral that has the same amount of electrons with hydrogen having one and stacking these electrons on till you can no longer stack electrons on to an atom. And each different atom has a number of electrons. The more the electrons, the more gravity I feel this possesses. Our DNA bodies are anti-gravitational devices, and we have to use minerals to keep us up and about, or we're going to just turn back to ash. I view magnetism as the electron valences. Now, many minerals have multiple electron valences. Uh, selenium has a negative 2 electron valence, and it has a positive 4 and a positive 6. It really wasn't until the year 2000 that they completely understood that this had to be negative 2, and it had to be attached to an amino acid called methionine, hence selenomethionine. So all the studies that were done before they knew this that would say selenium is no good here, and it did this, and it was bad, were all based on using the wrong oxidation state of selenium. Antimony has a, a mineral negative 3, positive 3, positive 5. We only need negative 3. Iodine, negative 1 
positive 1, 3, 5, and 7. We only use negative 1. And in the book, Minerals for the Genetic Code, I tell you exactly what mineral has what electron valence. Now, I did not bring enough charts uh, to pass out this chart to everybody. I have 30. We can make more. If you wish to have a copy of this uh, chart, you can go to my website, emineral.info, and download it. Or I can give you a copy. Now, I view uh, this chart as like a piano. There's octaves. And we go from a noble gas, which has no electrical charge, to another electrical, no electrical charge as a pattern. Now, argon is a mineral, and then off of argon is negative 1, and then sulfur is negative 2, phosphorus negative 3, silica plus 4, and then it goes 3, 2, 1, 0. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Including the subatomic particles, there are nine octaves to the minerals, with three of them being in the subatomic fields. If we start at the bottom and go 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and draw a line, that's one octave. And we do it nine times. And then I take the same numbering system, and I start at the very bottom, and I go 0, making radon gas the, the, the mineral that would represent 0. Negative 1 is iodine. Negative 2 is selenium. Negative 3 is phosphorus. Negative 4 is silica. Positive 4 carbon, boron. And then to have DNA work fairly well with the positive 2 mineral, it becomes the ratio of calcium to magnesium and positive 1 becomes the ratio of sodium to potassium with the single quarks, your up quark, down quark, strange quark, and your anti, uh, the, anti the, the, the other three there and are basically where your mind can be found thinking, so to speak. So iodine has the most gravitational forces. I think it has 93 electrons. You can't live without it. It just simply, you cannot live without it. It's estimated 80% of the people in the United States are iodine deficient. Selenium. Half the country has no selenium. The other half has the wrong. It's estimated that 80% of the world's population is selenium deficient. Now, the doctor talked about the Epstein-Barr virus and the cytomegalovirus. These two viruses get into your system when your selenium levels become too low, and there may be other factors, but one thing they do do. The guardian of the genetic code is called P53, and when P53 doesn't work, then normal cell apoptosis does not occur. The cytomegalo and the Epstein-Barr virus actually know how to put some super glue in the key to keep, P, to keep MDM2 allowing it to break from USB 7. There's two different genes, and there's another little enzyme that slips in there that allows P53 to function, and when P53 is functioning and is told to function, it punches holes in the mitochondria, and you, you lose complete control of your phosphorus molecules. So iodine is stored in every cell of the body, hyperaccumulating in the thyroid, breast tissue, and ovaries, whereas selenium is in every cell, hyperaccumulating in the testicles and in the thyroid. In the conversion of T4, which is a chemical made in your thyroid, to T3, it's called the thyroid stimulating hormone, and that hormone is selenium deficient. So the one-two punch to keep control of your genetic stability is iodine and selenium. Phosphorus is found in all the foods, and in the book, Minerals for Acupuncture Meridians, I apply, I mineralize the whole book, and I take all the laws of acupuncture, and they have one in particular called the husband-wife domination laws, and when you take a look at that, you'll find out that iodine tells phosphorus what to do. The only problem we got is when I was telling Dr. Paul he's need to get the fluoride out of the drinking water, is that the body in an iodine deficiency state thinks fluoride is iodine and starts making the chemicals with fluoride. Now we have another problem because now that molecule of fluoride is allowed entry into your cell, and it oscillates at such a fantastic vibrational state, which is 94 megahertz, and our DNA oscillates between 70 and 76, it actually causes your DNA coils to expand, and then you start losing your concardia cycles. Now, there's a big player here called boron that ma many people know about. You really do want to make sure that you understand what's going on with boron. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant had 25 tons of boron put onto it because it can accept all forms of radiation without changing the proton-neutron center, and it can give off the energy. 
Uh, South Korea sent all of its boron that the country had up to Japan, except they had such a big leak in the swimming pool, like I think it was 100,000 gallons a minute, that all the stuff just washed into the ocean and they weren't able to quell the, uh, the nuclear events that they were having there like they did at Chernobyl. This chart can also be looked as a circular motion. Uh, this is the chart that I overlay the eye radiology charts. That's the book I'm working on to make better sense of another form of weak magnetic energy. This particular chart, if the internet that I'm reading right, was actually a chart created by the Mayans. And they, I look at this chart and I've studied it for two years. I think this is the best mineral chart that shows the magnetic relationship of all minerals to DNA. Now here is the pattern I talked about going from one noble gas to the next. It goes, the, the electrovalences valences go zero, negative one, two, three, four, three, two, one, zero. Now the, the object uh, of making sure the fluoride is not in the drinking water, besides trying to get people to understand iodine and, and not have fluoride replace it, and by the way, if you use dental floss and fluoride toothpaste and Teflon coated frying pans and even drinking water in most places, is also that fluoride, that negative one, wants to attach to lithium. And as the doctor spoke this morning about all the psychotropic drugs out there, the Prozacs, well, what are they using? They're using fluoride to go in there and start stymieing lithium, for all I can say, except these pills have some real bad bite you in the butt effects. Might get some immediate results, but when you keep throwing this fluoride into your system and you keep dropping the iodine out, you start losing control of your basal metabolism. Uh, this is how I view the electron valences in reference to the light spectrum. And this chart here, uh, which may or may not be very good to see, I know I can't see it, each mineral uh, is, is, is in assigned a frequency in megahertz at one, and it's compared to hydrogen. Uh, Texas A&M has these MRI machines. They put minerals into these machines at 100% purity and I'm not exactly sure if they raise up and dance off the table for them, but they know where their peak oscillation is to a millionth of a megahertz. I've taken this information and I can take a protein sequence and I'm going to show you the pull to one that is upregulated or downregulated when you're consuming the mercury base and pull two is a major reader of your DNA code. I can give this a frequency and I can do this to all 22,000 genes in the whole genome of any plant you want. I can give you a a very specific frequency. I look at this as everything as a frequency. Now you'll see minerals on these charts where it says isotopes. Those are not directly related to the construct of a three-dimensional protein in the body. We have workhorses where cobalt uh, brings in iron, nickel, copper, uh, germanium, gallium, copper, and chromium, as well as molybdenum. And then I've also got the amino acid listed on this chart. These are all on my website at emineral.info. Uh, I personally uh, view the human spine as a replication of this mineral chart. And when I look at different vertebrae in the back, I am looking specifically at mineral imbalances in people and or some vitamins that's not allowing the minerals to work. Okay, we got the standard genetic code, which has been around since 61 or 62. There's another way of looking at it. I don't use that. Uh, okay, now, if you go to PubMed and you look up a particular sequence, I'll, I'll show you what I do for entertainment. This is the poll 2 gene in PubMed pulled up while a speech was being done this morning. And I bet it didn't. It's probably going to... Okay, we keep going. We look for what's called the FASTA sequence, where each three letters represents an amino acid. And if that amino acid by those three letters are then represented by a frequency of a mineral, I can generate a frequency. Now, this was the FASTA sequence for the pull, too. While I was sitting there, I pulled it down. And the program that I had made allows me to load this information in. When I hit that load button, oh, that's right, that doesn't work on this one. I'll load that data right now. I have, oh, I'm not going to save it. I have a frequency of that up there. I can tell you the electromagnetic attitude of it. I can tell you the average bonding angle. I've got a frequency. And then I have all 64 minerals and subatomic particles in the exact ratio that they're needed 
to create 72.552. Now I use the third law of physics. For every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I just flip the numbers upside down, and I believe what I'm creating is the link to antimatter. If 85% of the universe is antimatter and we're living in the 15%, each one of our genes has to not only be anchored in matter, it also has to be anchored in anti antimatter. Because I have many genes that has the same initial frequency, but the antifrequency is completely different. So when you start genetically modifying your foods, I, you have to pray that none of these frequencies get into you because you become out of balance in more ways than you can imagine. And yes, I do have, for example, there's neon. Neon falls with the UUA. It deals with leucine. It deals with this vertebrae. It deals with the ability of the magnetic energy to flow from the urinary bladder to the kidney at 5 o'clock. And if there's an emotional setting, that one would be censorship. Now, whether it's man or animal, whether you have two or one membrane, principles are the same. And Matt, everybody knows what the DNA is, double helix coil. And then we, we are, have the ability to break them apart and get snippets that we call genes. And then it comes out to the ribosomes. And then all these proteins are punched in. And at three picoseconds, this linear piece of protein flips into a three-dimensional structure. What gives that, that three-dimensional structure? I believe are all the trace minerals found within the biological system. And if you are absent or you have too much of various things, you will get a misfolding of proteins. Now your DNA code only allows you so many chances to make a protein, and it burns it out. This is called aging. If you don't make it the first time, it'll make it again. It keeps making it. It keeps making it. Lou Gehrig's disease is making it to the point that it breaks the toilet open and the cell dies. These are the sensors on the uh, outside of the cell that perceive the environment. So our biological needs for structure are amino acids. We gotta have the minerals, that gives us the vibrational energy which provides a three-dimensional shape and the polarity. The vitamins activate and facilitate mineral activity. Everything needs energy, so we have to have various forms of sugar. We have to have oils for lubrication. And if there's anything I've missed, that's everything else. Now, the book Minerals for Tumor Suppressing Genes, and you look at these mineral charts, I've got it down to four minerals and one vitamin that'll keep your DNA code working to the laws of physics provided by minerals. Iodine, selenium, boron, magnesium, and vitamin D3. Now, not too much has been talked about about telomeres, and if you're not aware what a telomere is, it's the cap at the end of the chromosomes. Vitamin D3 is known as the sunshine vitamin, uh, and its profound effects are found almost in every chemical reaction that I can think of. 400 obese African American, socially economic challenged women were given free blood tests and their telomeres were analyzed, and they give them the equivalent of 2,000 units of vitamin D3 a day, and in six months, their telomere length had tripled. Very simple thing to do. Make sure you know what your vitamin D3 levels are. If, if half the country lives in a goiter belt, make sure you're taking iodine. Half the country, well, almost 80% of the people in this room are selenium deficient. Most people don't even know what boron is. And how would you take it? I've been prescribing boron since 1984, and I never really comprehended how much I should be advising people to take. When I found out that the average Korean diet has 45 milligrams of boron in it, I started upping it to 12 to 18, and celery seed is a very good source of boron, and your fruit would be prunes, have the highest natural source of boron. <laughs> Everybody gets a bad job. On <laughs> now that's the biology of life. Your immune system is all the bacteria in your gut. Did anybody pick up a Scientific American magazine flying here like I did? Not very many of you. It's a yellow cover, and the whole issue is about the release of the human biome 10 days ago. Now, we all know what probiotics are. At least I hope we all know what probiotics are. They're the good bacteria that keep the bad things living. They found 10,000 different species of bacteria living in your gut. The good ones keep the bad ones under control. The good ones keep 
funguses from growing and yeast from growing and molds from growing. And the yeast, when they grow, they harbor the Epstein Barr virus. When we eat, all we're doing is feeding these bacteria. And these bacteria, they live, they excrete, and we absorb bacteria excretion. Now, some of these minerals have passive absorption capacity, but the most of your food's got to be processed by your bacteria. So in my office, we check people out for heavy metals, and I'm finding uranium all over the place. I'm finding antimony in everybody because they love to drink the water out of the bottles. We're finding people when they have a sample set in, we find out that they don't have any good bacteria, they're just full of bad bacteria. So in an effort to try to get people healthy, we do hair analysis, looking for minerals, we do fecal materials, trying to find out where the bacteria is, and we are running into more and more and more problems with bacteria in the gut because of glycate. Nineteen ninety-six autism one in ten thousand. Nineteen ninety-six celiac sprue one in ten thousand. You could do a blood test on a celiac patient. Yep, he's positive. Never have wheat again in his life, or whatever the things the other antigens are. Well, I think autism is down to one in fifty-eight boys, and celiac is down to one in thirty, one in one hundred thirty-five people. What happened in nineteen ninety-six that changed these numbers? The introduction of genetically modified foods. So we take DNA from another life form, throw it in the food we're eating, turning them into BP pesticide makers. You're eating all this stuff. Well, what is, how does this glycate work? Well, they put it on the fields, and the first thing it does is it kills all the good bacteria. It takes out the immune system of plant, and the plant dies. Then it kills the bad bacteria. So you eat this stuff, so what's the first thing that's going to change? It's going to change your biology. It kills all the good bacteria. On GM Watch this morning, they came out with a report that says all the, pe all the people they tested living in cities in Europe urinated glycate. Haven't caught this man. His name is Dr. Don Huber, professor emeritus, Purdue University, plant pathology. He's spending the rest of his life telling you what I'm telling you, and I'm repeating him. Heck of a guy. I, I know there's no climate changes, but when him and I spoke February 6th up at Rochester, Minnesota, across the street from Mayo Clinic, we were supposed to go home. We took all these jackets. It was supposed to be six below zero. It was 61 degrees on the way to the airport. Okay, the, the, the chemicals we're talking about, they'll take the minerals out of the tank. They'll take the minerals out of the plant. They take the minerals out of the soil. And these are the minerals that get reduced when you consume anything that's got the GMO stuff with it. First you lose your boron, then calcium, then cobalt, then copper, iron, potassium, magnesium, manganese, nickel, and zinc. And actually manganese should be moved to the top. Manganese is the number one mineral that inhibits the growth of plant. Okay, so what I did, I'm not, you know, he's Dr. Huber speaking, Jeffrey Smith is speaking, and I'm like going, hey, I gotta outdo these guys. So I go to PubMed. And I go to the gene section, and I type in calcium homo sapien, and I find out that out of the 22,000 genes, there's 2,487 genes that actually have the name calcium in the gene. And I did it to manganese, and it's 198. And I did it to cobalt, 185. Copper and iron and nickel and zinc and boron. And then I said, well, if these are the primary minerals that are affected, and since all minerals are attracted together by electron valences, we can just throw the third law and say for every reaction there's an equal and opposite reaction. We might as well throw all the minerals in is what it amounts to. And we go to sulfur and oxygen and selenium and phosphorus. Well, all the math is we come up with 14,812 genes of your 22,000 genes can be affected from glycate. Well, if you say there's 25, then we're up to 59%. Okay, as, as promised there, Fukushima. I read one article that says that they had all the spent radiation from Japan in one building, 660,000 rods, sitting in a swimming pool, and they had water rolling through it, and uh, the swimming pool got a crack in it, and within three to four hours, that swimming pool got up to 3,000 degrees centigrade, and it took the zirconium containers that had the uranium and the plutonium stored in it, and at 3,000 degrees, this stuff turned into hydrogen. And then the top of the building blew off as a hydrogen explosion, and there was 3,000 degrees heat. They put the stuff up, oh, I don't know, about as high as I guess you could go. 
and that within 11 days, this was the wind drift and the different colors are the height of the particles. This was 11 days after Fukushima. And I know it's very hard to see, but there's quite a bit of the United States in there. Iodine's released as iodine-131. Well, there's a bunch of them, but the half-lives, well, we've got to be more worried about. Iodine-131, in case you don't know it, is a gas. And that gas came over pretty quick. Now, how many Americans have died? Does anybody know how many Americans have died? Not many of you know. December 11th, they said 14,000. 14,000? How come we haven't heard about this? 14,000 dead Americans? Well, it was all newborns and unborns. Because the women were breathing the iodine in, it goes right to the baby's brain, and it just causes babies to die. Cesium-135 and 137 is where the real big problem is, is because that there uh, wants to attach to iodine. We'll go back to my mineral chart. No, we won't. Trust me, it, it, just like sodium wants to attach to chloride, iodine wants to attach to uh, cesium as the lessons from Chernobyl, and you just go to PubMed and type in iodine, cesium, and thyroid cancer. And the, the report that came out December 11th was produced by a scientist in Chernobyl. Strontium-90, uh, our body has a need for strontium. And if you have uh, a situation where you want your bone cells to continually replenish themselves, strontium takes a stem cell and coaxes it into becoming a bone instead of skin. But I'm not quite sure what strontium-90 is going to do. Now, uh, the Fairwinds, uh, Arnie Gunderson, he's predicted approximately a one million increase of cancer in the next 20 years because of this. But if the expression alkalize or die and keeping your tumor suppressing gene is working, I've looked and analyzed, just as I showed you how all those proteins unfold, 60% of the tumor suppressing genes need cesium to function. And you've got to have these tumor suppressing genes at the right frequency. And if you start taking minerals that are radioactive, they're not oscillating at the same frequency, so the protein is not going to be shaped right. And I do believe we'll be looking at a far more significant number of cancers at a zero to that. I just learned about tritium this morning. Um, they're going to take a basement, whatever the word basement in Japanese means, and pump it into the ocean starting, I think, tomorrow. And then there was 460,000 times the amount of xenon that's been produced with the nuclear events that were over there. When viruses take over, this is what can happen. This is actually the human papillary virus that's growing on a person. They call her the wood lady. And the virus has commanded the cell to replicate in lieu of what the virus wants it to become. Now, the other day it got a little bit cloudy. I did come out with the tablet. I'm using iodine from the north side of, of um, Iceland, organic selenium, organic boron, and vitamin D3. This is the only thing that I could tell all of you to take a serious look at that you can get for less than 35 cents a day to protect your DNA code from the environment around us. Oops. Well, that went a lot quicker than I thought. So I guess I could entertain questions for quite a while. Because I, I normally don't go through those cell uh, that fast because I talk too fast. <laughs> Eleven minutes to go. Okay, we got ten minutes of questions. If that's uh, yeah, I think uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put the mic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the microphone over here. So for those of you who have a question, uh, maybe you can uh, walk over here, line up. We've got uh, ten minutes of questions. Uh, please remember to uh, just uh, identify yourself before you ask a question. My name is Glenn Ryan. Nice to meet you. Thank uh, you Glenn. Very interesting talk. So you're obviously uh, making correlations between um, phenomena that we're all familiar with, but you're making these correlations that we're not familiar with. So my question is, do you have any actual experimental data that says, for example, if someone is um, has excessive amounts of boron in their body, 
you can, I gather, but I didn't quite understand you, how you do it, but you can calculate the corresponding uh, uh, genetic code, the corresponding frequencies, and I assume you have some kind of a treatment program, for example, to treat someone who had excess boron. So do you have any experimental data that says, well, if I broadcast this particular frequency or give them this particular mineral, that you can actually lower the, their amounts of boron? Or is, or the very is, first question, is, what the first question was. Well, that, that's the question. I want to know whether this is all theory, which is a very interesting theory. Or oh, it's a lot there, of theory. Yeah, yeah, or is there any experimental data to support your Well, I, I guess experimental data would be doing tissue mineral analysis and finding yeah, uranium and all example. these minerals. Yeah, yeah. And then I use something very close to homeosis. I use homeopathy. I yeah. detoxify, okay. use a lot of fatty omega-3s to try to pull the heavy metals out. And then I put back into the diet the minerals that I think are the key minerals right. to gain control of your genetic code. So, so you actually haven't measured the net effect no. of that program which you had developed uh, on the, on no. the person? That's, well, yeah. yes and no. Uh, I have been working with this concept for 30 years. Um, basically, you know, I see 50 people a day. So uh, they get better, but yeah, basically, it, 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 it would be a testimonial right. to what happens when people right. come in and, gotcha. and what's the placebo. I mean, what am I actually seeing when I do certain things and how they change? I mean, I tell anybody it's really easy to put your bones in. Why they come out? What are you doing that's wrong? What's, you know, where are the excesses in your diet? Where's the deficiencies? Where's the toxicities? Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Don Daniels, I understand. Uh, the glyphosate? Glyphosate, also called Roundup. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's that's connected to Roundup. That's no, that is Roundup. That is Roundup. It's being found in the groundwater, in the drinking water all over the And the air. And the GMO crops cause us to create it in our gut, which... Now, we don't create it, but we absorb, we absorb if you eat it, it's it's 12-fold in the food that is genetically modified to not die from it. Yeah. So if you have a piece of corn and you eat it, and then you eat a piece of GMO corn, it has 12 times the roundup before that plant would die. So it's going in and it's disabling, if not killing, your probiotics. Right, it messes with the probiotics. It's yes. also endocrine disruptor. Uh, well, if you're, if you're taking out your immune system, right. that'll affect everything. Okay. Um, the, immune, the, the endocrine disruptors come from the bottled water, the BHAs and the BH, uh, the B, or there's two different two different hormone disruptors and a heavy metal called antimony that comes from your bottled water. Okay, so Monsanto is destroying the planet. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, it's very, very scary to think of the future with what they're doing. The lab animals that are fed the GMO stuff don't live past a third regeneration period. And I believe there was a major company that is being investigated and possibly sued by the federal government for falsifying why the animals they say live when they all die. It, it's 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 scary <coughs> because they went and bought all the seed companies. I mean, the, it, Dow, I mean, uh, Monsanto. Just three weeks ago, there was a company set to release why the bees are dying from a particular chemical. So they just went and bought the company and says there is no press release. Yes, sir. Unicorn, uh, could you please clarify uh, how was determined which. Um, mineral influence which, uh, which meridian, and how these frequencies of minerals were determined? Just pick one. Oh, can you turn the camera off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you asked. 1981, I went to bed, and I was stressed about a patient, and I told myself to resolve it. I woke up off the, roost of a, off the coast of Aruba, and I went into a vault of magnetic knowledge, and I come out of it, and I said, my gosh, it's going to take me 20 years to write that stuff down, and I've been writing for 30. That's where it started. And when I woke up, I made a wall chart about the size of that. I put the human spine down in the middle. I put all the minerals and the subatomic particles, and I put the acupuncture meridians off to the, the side, and I decided that the first organ that's formed because of my background and understanding embryology was the heart. The second organ is the small intestine, and I put it there, and then I just worked it up and down, and I've been working with it for 30 years. And now I took the link between uh, minerals and um, the proteins, the amino acids, from a book from John Johnson. It's called DNA in the I Ching. And I collated those two together. And I did that in 1996. And it seems to have held up. The, it's held up for what I've been using it for. 
And what about frequencies of minerals? The frequencies of the minerals coming from Texas A&M, they have an MRI machine and they would put in these minerals at 100% purity, or at least as hard, best they can, and they set the magnets for 100 megahertz, which equals one for hydrogen. So instead of saying 200, 300, or 400, because these minerals have different vibrational frequencies at different settings, I stayed with my data trying to equal everything to the most abundant mineral in the universe being hydrogen. So that's empirical data, and there's also a college upstate New York, I think it's in Ithaca, that's produced the same material. But you can find the MRI mineral tables on the internet, and I believe you go to Texas A&M for those. Marcia Adams, and thank you for an interesting talk, excuse me. <coughs> but I'm wondering where you got your radiation data, and uh, you referenced it uh, as per altitude. Uh, was that also giving concentrations? And uh, one thing I'm wondering about is I run a geophysical observatory in Sedona, Arizona. And uh, part of the things that we do is monitor radiation. And uh, I have learned that there are many different tricks. There's the article right there. Okay. Uh, in the air over Lithuania. What about the United States? Uh, I have watched the, uh, the jet stream, and uh, I have detected no difference uh, in the six weeks after Fukushima in any kind of radiation falling in Sedona, even after a strong uh, rainstorm. So I have no I comment on that. I, I just went off the wind drift charts created. Right. I, I, well, I think there's a lot of hysteria about this going on. There are people on the internet who are claiming to run all over the United States and measure radiation, but they've done it in a very inappropriate way. Uh, there are naturally occurring uranium, uranium deposits in the ground that can uh, make a measurement just coming from the ground vary by 50%. It also varies with altitude, and it also varies with the type of rock structure that you have. And there are people running around the Internet uh, who have recently bought these, uh, you know, uh, Geiger counters that they really don't know how to use. And one fellow went up on a mountaintop and placed the... Uh, Geiger counter on granite, which is known to be radioactive, <laughs> and then was making great claims about uh, all of this is coming from Fukushima. So I think there's a lot of misinformation uh, going on about the amount of radioactivity uh, that has reached the United States. Well, the bluefin tunas uh, have been, in the past seven days, have been detected off the coast of uh, California to be containing cesium. The uh, sea kelp right off the coast of California had been proven to have radioactive iodine in it. The seals up in Alaska are all displaying radiation sickness, and apparently so are the bears that are eating the sick seals that can't run away anymore. Now, I think the most uh, impressive hype I've seen on the Internet, as you're basically alluding to, was a guy driving down the road in British Columbia, and he took a wipe and he put it next to his Geiger counter and the thing just pegged right off the roof with nothing more than grabbing the water off the windshield three weeks after the winds were blowing. Mm -hmm. um, Are there any known control values uh, for the seals? And, and no, the, no. The All I said was the United States Wildlife was going to be investigating, looking for viruses and stuff like that. Right. Uh, but when I started seeing and reading that the tuna had made their migration from Japan to the United States and they were checking, and checking them, and the EPA is going, well, it's below our threshold. It's okay still. It's just it's not okay with me. I wouldn't eat anything with known amounts of cesium-135. Cesium follows the potassium pathways into your body. When it's in the cells, it doesn't get out until the cell autophages and goes away. And then it's free again to follow more potassium pathways. Okay, thank you. I, I, I can agree that there is a lot of misinformation out there. And this type of misinformation went on for years, but all you got to do is go to PubMed and type in cesium-135 and, and radiation and thyroid and put the word Chernobyl after it, and there's 900 articles there. They're going to have the same type of a thing that's happening uh, because I don't think that they really told us the truth on the amount of radiation that was dumped. That swimming pool over there got a crack big enough to put 100,000 gallons a minute in to equal that that was coming out and they had some real problems with some nuclear events that were being picked up on their, the type of machinery that picks this up three miles away. And they're still doing it. They're still dumping the radiation just into the ocean.
Get this out of here.